All right, we're official now. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, watching some Olympics as uh, perhaps you have and uh, over the course of the last uh, couple of weeks and all of what's been going on with the Olympics, whether they'd be held People of Tokyo and actually even the Prime Minister of Japan wanted to cancel it, but uh, they found out they didn't have the power to cancel it. Wasn't that interesting? The uh, nation itself did not have the power over the Olympic uh, uh, Committee. Uh, once you accept the bid in your, your city, you give up certain rights and that was one of them. And so uh, it's quite an interesting thing. Plus just well, the events themselves, the Simone Bile making a, uh, news there when we talk about that later. Uh, all four foot eight of her. Yeah, very powerful icon and has something to teach us. So I'm, I'm just going to start with a poem and then we'll sort of uh, open it up the way we do uh, to to sort of get some always to try to shoot a poem that uh, try to do a poem that'll encourage us, especially to uh, Keep meditating. So here we go. Millions of people all around the world are spending hours glued to their flat screens watching Olympic athletes compete for the gold. Millions of people think it's laudable, even heroic for an Olympic athlete to train maybe eight hours a day for four years for an event that lasts anywhere from a couple hours to less than 10 seconds. Even though billions of people let me say that again, millions of people, it's laudable, even heroic for an Olympic athlete to spend eight hours a day for maybe four years to prepare for an event that may last less than 10 seconds. Millions of people would think it was kooky and even bizarre for a person to train 20 minutes twice a day in meditation. Millions of people would think it was kooky, even bizarre for a person to train 20 minutes a day, maybe twice a day in meditation, or even more insane to go to a week long Zen retreat where you meditate in silence for hours every day. Even though billions of people plug in their cell phones every day. How many think it's necessary to plug in their soul phones every day to the source so that they can remain connected? So that they can remain human? Buddha and Jesus, Thomas Merton, the Dalai Lama, they trained for decades to become hotspots to help us learn how to connect to the source and to radiate its energy to one and all. Buddha and Jesus, Thomas Merton, and the Dalai Lama, people like that trained for decades to become hotspots to help us learn how we can connect and remain connected to the source. How we could radiate that energy to one and all. The real Olympics will not be televised. The real Olympics will not be televised. No, it will happen whenever and wherever you just sit down in the silence. Connect to the source and train yourself to ponder Olympian mysteries. Like, where do we come from? 
what are we? Where are we going? And what remains when we're gone? The real Olympics would not be televised. They'll happen whenever and wherever you just sit down in silence, connect to the source and train yourself to ponder Olympian mysteries. Where do we come from? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? What remains when we're gone? So now hear this, you are an Olympian at heart. Now hear this, you are an Olympian at heart. But will you consent to the training? Now hear this, please hear this. You are an Olympian at heart, but will you? consent to the training. Yeah, that sort of says what I've been thinking lately. Um, we, we, you know, we're focused on these uh, and it is a focus, uh, uh, but to put people up on a pedestal, which we do literally, put people up on a pedestal uh, for, um, yeah, well, you know, laudable efforts. There's a guy who won the uh, triathlon, the Norwegian guy. He trained eight hours a day for five years because they postponed this thing. Eight hours a day for five years for this hour and a half event. And, you know, that's not nothing. You know, you give this guy, you know, he knew what it would take to do that. And he put in the time. Um, now the, the question is, you know, and I do think this is, this is just the truth of the whole enterprise here that we're all Olympians at heart. You know, Olympus, Mount Olympus, by the way, was the abode of the gods. It wasn't about a medal. They got a real, they just got a laurel reef. You know, we've upgraded, you know, now you get some actual bling, you know, you get the gold, but they got a laurel reef, which was in a few days that was gone. You see, uh, those of you who, well, people in Louisville know this story that uh, after uh, Muhammad Ali uh, won the, the gold in the, uh, for boxing in the Olympics in 1960 in Rome, when he came back to Louisville, he was just Cassius Clay back then. He went into a restaurant to eat, you know, and they turned him away. They said, no, your type doesn't eat here. I don't know what transpired there, but uh, uh, Ali left and just was running along the, uh, the Ohio River and just pitched his medal in the river. You know, we put these guys up on pedestals where, you know, it's a big nationalist thing, you know, the metal count of the nations, you know, which is a great, you know, the great nation and all this stuff. He won the medal, but when he was back in Louisville, he wasn't an Olympian. He was, well, you fill in the blank. And uh, that, uh, that was a big moment for him. He realized uh, he never went back to the Olympics, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what is all this? And you know, oh, why is some, Simone Bile getting so much grief for basically it, what is she, 24 or something like that? You know, been training all these years and you know, has done an amazing thing. Hurdles through space, if you've ever seen any of these people, hurdles through space at great risk for her own body. Uh, and, and then, you know a little bit more about this whole Olympic metaphor. There's all these people looking and judging and measuring. The kind of Olympics we're talking about, I'm talking about anyway, that I've been training in for decades. And I'm trying to encourage you to get serious about this. 
the metals did your metals are in the Ohio River. The metals are you know in somebody's pawn shops. Uh, when you go on beyond this life to whatever's next, those metals won't go with you. Your bank account won't go with you. Everything you own will be somebody else's yard sale or estate sale. Uh, why don't we start thinking about what will go on? Uh, I had a couple of Tibetans stay here for a couple of weeks. They were supposed to stay at the uh, at Gethsemane at the Abbey uh, for a couple of weeks. They were, they were going through contemplative houses in the United States, but the East West monk, uh, Father Harold, uh, got Alzheimer's uh, and, and so when the monks showed up, nobody was expecting them. Nobody knew what to do with them. And one of the monks called Brother Placid called me up. He said, hey Z, we got these Tibetan monks here and uh, Harold, you know, really, you know, he can't, he doesn't know what, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. So they don't seem too happy. Can you take them off our hands? And I said, yeah, all right. And so they came here, they came here and a little taller guy and a smaller guy. And, and, and the smaller guy was, uh, he was what they call a Rinpoche. In other words, he was a famous teacher and who they went and found. Uh, the Tibetans are the only ones who do this. When they have a great teacher, they go looking for him. Well, why is that? Well, the idea is you don't lose your spiritual maturity when you cross that thin red line into what's next. When you graduate from this incarnation to whatever's next, you don't lose your spiritual maturity. That's what they call karma, positive karma. You, you know, and you don't lose your understanding of the teachings. So when they find these guys, I mean, the Dalai Lama it was the 14th time around. He, he mastered what would be the equivalent for us of getting a doctorate in theology by the time he was 16. And he didn't study very much. He's famous for saying that I was really a, really a poor student. You know, and so uh, the least the Tibetans have been working on this basis. And uh, so I asked this Rinpoche that I had here, I said, well, uh, and he had pretty good English. And, and I said, well, what do you remember from the previous life? And he said, oh, it's just a couple of little like snapshots. And he mentioned those, he said, but mostly it's the teachings. When I, as a young boy, when I started looking, at it, it was all very familiar. And he had this kind of, spiritual uh, maturity, ripening, see? And that's what I'd like you to consider that, uh, that um, that's what really counts. Shakespeare said it, he said, ripeness is all. So how ripe are we and what do we do to, you know, if you, you can do this with fruit, well, human beings, in certain situations, you put yourself in certain situations like fruit and you will ripen. You can't rush it, but you sort of study what are the situations that will turn you into really a ripe human being. Well, days like this, you know, you guys showed up for this. This is a spiritual practice going 90 minutes here uh, uh, with teaching and and then uh, meditation and then conversation among people who are trying to do this is a serious stuff. Get serious, get, get serious about your life. Those questions, these are questions that come from all contemplative traditions. Where do we come from? That's a question of the source. The gods are not on Olympus anymore. The gods are on Hulu. Netflix, you know, that's what Nietzsche meant when he said God is dead. He wasn't saying that that energy is dead or that source was dead. He was just saying we, we lost it. It got, uh, the gods in the 17th and 18th century were, were a machine because of the industrial revolution. And we even had God as a kind of machine then, but, but then after the machine, it became uh, economics. We're living in an economic age. Uh, the tallest uh, structures in the cities now are not the church spire. You know, they're not the temples. They're the uh, twin towers, you know, mercantile. So then the economy became God. And I think right now in the 21st century, uh, the God is data. What a world we're living in.
big data, they call it. So our ideas of that shift, and they shift farther away from us. The contemplative traditions say, no, you, you have that divine spark that they were talking about back as far as, you know, back into the Hindus, you know, probably the oldest formal religion that you have. You are Olympian at heart. Uh, the way you do the training. See, so we have, you guys are showing up for these, some of you regularly. It's great. What do you do between heart to hearts? Do you check in every day? Do you spend some time going into deep interior science or at least aspiring to? Some days you don't get there because so many voices about what you should be. The voices of the family growing up, the voices of the culture, what it means to be relevant in this world, you know? Uh, and then there's just, the, there's the inner voice. You're looking for direction in life. And especially when you get to second half of life where things happen like people die or you retire and you're wondering, well, what next? Uh, where's my direction now? It's, it's always in there, speaking, whispering though, and uh, drowned out by all these other voices. So are you gonna take some time in uh, silence every day um, to listen? especially in times of crisis, of crisis of where do I, what am I doing with my life now? This is important stuff. You know, what are we? Question of just what are human beings for? To work and make money and buy things, is that it? That's what our culture says, we're consumers. We're not even citizens anymore. Close to that point in this country as they take away the right to vote. What are we? Be consumers. Yeah, uh-huh. Where are we going? Where does all this go? Where's your life going? These are questions we're sitting with, we're writing about, we're spending some soul time with. Okay, that's training, you see. What remains when we're gone? Big questions. These are the kind of questions that are worth thinking about. Uh, you know, I think it was wonderful to see Simone, uh, Simone Biles and uh, the uh, young uh, Haitian Japanese tennis player, I'm missing her name now, but they both sort of backed off this thing. They backed off this, uh, uh, Joseph Campbell once said, he said, we're all so busy climbing the ladder we haven't yet realized that the ladder's leaning against the wrong house. And so they're getting off the ladder and uh, they're, they're realizing the immense pressure put on people who are in this kind of space. But it's just, what ladder is, what house is your ladder leaning against that will last? These are great questions, yeah. So let's, let's, we're gonna uh, move into the, the interior silent space where we could listen to these questions, they're reverberating in you, but also listen to uh, a deeper voice that would, that would maybe weigh in on these questions. So there is a dialogue that's waiting to happen. You got the rest of your life for this. Don't miss this opportunity to sit down every day for some time and have this dialogue with the soul. That's where direction comes from. So let's, uh, let's, let's jump into that now. And then when we come out back on the, on the far side, uh, we'll be able to uh, have a little bit more sitting and then also to, if something comes forth from all this, you can share it with the group. We've all been there, it's quite a rich time. So let's uh, get into meditation pose now.